How many of y'all's favorite holiday is Thanksgiving? With all of the food, okay. Okay, okay, it's a few. How many of y'all fav- would say your favorite holiday is um, Christmas? Okay, okay. How many of y'all's uh, um, favorite holiday you would say is like, I don't know if this is technically a holiday, but Halloween. Okay, we got a few people. We got a few people. How many of y'all are like, no, my favorite holiday is my birthday? We got a few. I knew there was a few of y'all out there. How many of y'all would say that your favorite holiday is Easter? Oh, Oh, look, all of the super Christians, they thought about it. (laughs) Well, look, check it out. If you did not raise your hand for Easter... I just want you to know that statistically speaking, you're among the majority. Listen up. If you didn't say Easter, you're among the majority, right? And I know some people thought about, oh, wait, I got to in church. But I mean, even just like for millennials, for Gen Z, even my son, who's five years old, um, I was picking him up a few, a few um, weeks ago from daycare. And we were riding, and he looked out his window, and he saw somebody with Easter decorations. And he was like, why do they got their Easter decorations out right now? It's not even Easter, which Easter is basically next, not this Sunday, but the next Sunday. And I looked, and I was like, well, we put our Christmas tree up, like, around Thanksgiving. Like, we put our Christmas tree up pretty early. We're going to get our money's worth. Ain't that right, Brittany? Yeah. And so we'll take it down maybe, like, right before February. But, um... But it's like, that's the mindset. But then I think about, too, like, not even just, like, Christmas. Like, even with things that are not so holy holidays, right? Like Halloween. Like, when we see all of the, the spooky stuff, right? We don't really think that. And, and that just kind of sat with me because, in reality, even I wrestle with this, right? Like, my, my favorite holiday that I would probably say is Christmas. But when I was pondering this message, which Easter is right around the corner again, I thought about, why is that? When Easter is technically the greatest holiday in human history, right? And we'll we'll go more deep into that, but I just want to I just want us to ponder that and and just kind of really like think about why Easter is not so high on our our list, right? And I and I kind of get it actually because the holidays that I mentioned, we they kind of like holidays that are like, what's in it for me, right? Right? It's like Thanksgiving, I get a lot of food, I get a week off of school, all of the sales are happening, so I get discounts during Black Friday, Cyber Monday, all of these different things, right? And Christmas, man, like, what beats Christmas, right? It's gifts, right? Gifts under the tree, excitement, the, you feel the, the, the Christmas spirit in the air, right? There's millions of movies probably now. There's thousands of movies. There's songs. It's that nostalgic feeling you get, right? Even if we don't get snow, we get excited when we think about snow, right? We, we, we think about all these things. We get family. We get food. And then when we think about our birthdays, right? Unless your birthday is on Christmas Eve like mine, you don't really celebrate your birthday like that because you're overshadowed by Jesus. But, but like with your birthday, right, you usually get maybe a gift, right? You maybe get a dinner. You get cake, for those of us that are humans and like cake, right? Ice cream, right? But you also get something that's really special, which is recognition, right? Today is my day, right? But with, with Easter, as, as we walk through these next two weeks of this series called Prism, I just want to kind of recalibrate our thoughts about Easter as maybe I'm, 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 this is not a sales pitch to say why Easter should be your favorite holiday, but it's to, to kind of really deepen our our, um, our love and appreciation for the Easter holiday. And so as a matter of fact, I have four goals for this series. So the four goals that I have for these next two weeks is just to prepare our hearts for this holiday, right? Easter's a week and a half away. I want us to also together grow in our understanding of Easter. Like what is it about Easter, right? We know, yeah, Jesus rose from the dead, but what else do we need to know about Easter? And by the way, for me to even just say that like that, it kind of Hurts my heart to think that's kind of the collective of society. It's like, yeah, Jesus raised from the dead. Like, that's a big deal, right? So we want to grow in our understanding of Easter. We want to deepen our appreciation for what Christ did and what he went through up to the point of Easter. And then we want to figure out ways to demonstrate our faith and our gratitude by praise and worship through 
through song, but also through other means, right? So before we kick off into what Easter is and, and how we can do all of these things, um, we're going to do a quick recap of Jesus's life from Christmas up to um, Easter. So if you would turn your attention to the screen. We've been looking at the story of Jesus as it's told in Luke's gospel. It begins with the arrival of an unlikely king born in poor, humble circumstances. Then we saw Jesus as a teacher, a prophet. He went throughout Israel calling people to a radical way of life, where enemies become friends, the poor are cared for, where people find forgiveness for their failures. He went from town to town inviting people to follow him and live under God's reign in this upside down way. And he did many signs and wonders. So many Israelites begin to hope that he would rescue Israel from the Romans and set up a new kingdom of peace and justice. In short, that he would bring the kingdom of God. Now the religious leaders of the day were also hoping for God's kingdom. But to them, the message of Jesus was a threat. Yeah, they had expected to gain power and prestige when this all went down. But Jesus said God's kingdom belongs to the poor, to the outsider, and that real power is serving others in love. This conflict intensified when Jesus, while in Jerusalem, disrupted the temple sacrifices and called Israel's leaders a gang of rebels. So they arrested Jesus and they had him accused before the Roman authorities of being a rebel king. He was handed over for execution even though he was innocent. Then he was taken outside the city and put to death on false charges. Yeah, and then comes Easter. But let, let's unpack that real quick. So there was a few highlights of that video. First, we see the birth, right? The birth of our Savior, right? Jesus, God, coming to earth, Emmanuel, right? God with us, he's born. That's the Christmas story, right? And then Jesus grows up. And as Jesus grows up, he, he becomes ready for ministry. And he starts to... Uh, collect a following. He has um, a, a large following. Basically, he went viral, right? He had a huge following, but he had 12 primary disciples that, that um, studied under him. And during his ministry, Jesus, um, he, he did many miracles, right? He was known as a teacher. He was known as a prophet, but he did a ton of miracles, right? He, he turned water into wine. He calmed the storms, right, with just a word. He healed the blind, the lame, the sick, right? And he rose people from the dead, right? He's doing all of these crazy miracles, these amazing things, these signs and wonders. And then, like Mark taught on, at the previous series, he presents this idea and his teaching that, that we call the upside down kingdom, where Jesus kind of flips the way power looks on his head, right? And so Jesus basically teaches things like the last shall be first, right? The servant is going to be the greatest of us all which was contrary to the, the teaching of the religious elites in his time. So Jesus made a lot of enemies, right? Where I'm from, it's like the, you're messing up their money, right? And so that's what people say where I'm from. And so he made a lot of enemies. And so enter the story of Easter. But I want to uh, kind of give a definition of Easter. I think sometimes when we look at Easter again, we look at just one particular day of Easter. And while... Um, Easter, which is called Resurrection Day, and, and um, that's what we would call Resurrection Day. It's the day that Jesus rose from the dead. There's seven other days that are attached to, to Easter or what I would actually call Holy Week. And so Holy Week essentially is the seven days leading up to Easter. So Sunday through Saturday, and then Easter is that eighth day on a Sunday, right? And so today we'll, we'll kind of cover five of the days. And Jesus, by the way, I'll just throw, throw this as a disclaimer. We're only going to unpack like portions of each day because Jesus was a busy man, right? If he's going viral and he's walking everywhere and thousands of people are following him, like we can't really understand everything that he did. But I'm just going to give a couple of highlights from each day so we can kind of prepare our hearts, our minds, our understanding, and our appreciation for Easter. All right. So day one, everybody say day one. Oh, y'all could have said that better than that. Say day one. Day one. There we go. Say Palm Sunday. Palm Sunday. How many of y'all are familiar with Palm Sunday, right? Yeah, I know when um, last Palm Sunday, my kids came home with these little cut out palm branches and they were like, Hosanna, Hosanna, yay, Jesus. I'm like, oh, they teaching my kids Jesus. But um, 
But yeah, so Palm Sunday, why is it called Palm Sunday? Well, basically it's called Palm Sunday because literally Jesus is making this triumphal entry into Jerusalem after he's made this large following, after he's went viral, everybody's following him. And now they're starting to say, this guy is the Messiah. This guy is the king of God's kingdom. So a bunch of people grab um, palm branches and they lay them out on the road as a sign of saying royalty is coming. And so actually John chapter 12 Verses 12 through 13, put it like this. If we can get it on board, there we go. The next day, the great crowd that had come for the festival heard that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. They took palm branches and went out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the king of Israel. They're declaring him king, which... There's not enough time to unpack all of this, but I'll just tell you, Jesus in this moment is fulfilling tons of prophecy for over thousands of years, right? Or over a thousand years, he's fulfilling prophecies, and he's also marking the start of the end of his earthly ministry. The crowd is shouting, praise Jesus. But it's crazy because we know the story, right? We know how it ends. And the same crowd that was shouting, praise Jesus, were shouting, crucifix him. Crucify him four and a half days later. So that's day one. And then basically Jesus did the rest of his thing on that day, went to sleep, woke up the next day. So say day two. Day two. Say holy Monday. holy Monday. So this day is a day where we probably are familiar with the story because Jesus cleanses the temple. How many are familiar with this story? So maybe when I say cleanse, you might not understand it 100%. But it's the time when Jesus goes into the temple and sees the money changers, right? They're they're collecting money off of people traveling in, and they basically turn the temple of God into a business, and they're taking advantage of people. So Jesus goes in, and he clears the temple. So um, let's get that scripture, Matthew 21, 12 through 13 on there. It says, Jesus entered the temple courts and drove out all who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of, the, of those selling doves. And he said, it is written, he said to them, my house will be called a house of prayer, but you are making it a den of robbers. So essentially, Jesus was about his father's business. And in this instant, Jesus, again, is demonstrating his authority as the, as the, as the true authority over Israel. And uh, he basically prioritized the purity and the sanctity of God's house. But also, it wasn't just about the temple. I want y'all to be clear. I want to be clear with y'all. It's not just about the temple. It was also about those that were coming, right? It would be like if Mark was preaching on um, last Wednesday and, and I was standing outside and I was like, hey, you want to come see Jesus? Well, you got to pay to get this, right? That's what they were doing. They were turning it into a house to make money. And Jesus wasn't playing that. And so not only were they disregarding God, they were also hindering people from worshiping God freely. And then Jesus did this. Actually, Jesus stayed in the temple for a while right after this, and he did more miracles. He preached more sermons and brought people to to him. And then he got tired, went to sleep, woke up the next day, and it was day three. Say day three. three. So day three... It's called Holy Tuesday. Now, this one is a real busy day for Jesus. Jesus um, gives what's called the Mount of Olives Discord. And so during this time, Jesus and his disciples, they climb up on the Mount of Olives, which if, uh, if you're familiar with the scriptures, Jesus and his disciples, they, they traveled the Mount of Olives a lot. Like that was their hangout place, right? So it's like me going to hang out at Chick-fil-A or something, right? That was their spot. But when they were up there, Jesus' disciples are like, man, Jesus, look at this. Like, they they probably thinking they on top of the road, because they're hanging out with Jesus, right? After all of this, like, everybody want to be with Jesus. This is like me being best friends with Taylor Swift. I don't know, right? And so it's like, man, look, even though I'm not Taylor, hey, no, you can't come see Taylor without me, right? And the point is, they probably like, man, look at this, Jesus. This is amazing. They're sitting on top of the mountain. Look at the temple. It's so amazing. Jerusalem, God must really love us, right? And Jesus said, basically, I'm paraphrasing my words, you know that temple ain't going to be there that much longer. Now, Jesus, at this moment, actually predicts 
the destruction of the temple and the destruction of Jerusalem, which actually happened less than 40 years later. Jesus also gives a lot of prophecy. And I, and I cannot unpack all of this, but if you're familiar with Revelation, Daniel, like that's what he's giving an insight to. And then, but this is what he does, because if you've read any of those books, you know that life is going to be hard on planet Earth. It's already hard. Can I get an amen? amen. But it, it will get harder. And Jesus is telling them this, and, but he gives them hope. He tells them about his second coming. And, and the disciples, by the way, they still kind of like, like, you with us. Like, you the Messiah. You can raise people from the dead. What we, you know? And, but he's telling them, I'm going to come back, but it's going to get bad before it gets better. So again, Jesus has a busy day. He goes to sleep because he's tired. He wakes up again, and now it's what? Day what? Day four. Say day four. four. All right. This is where it kind of takes a turn. This is where it takes a turn. Also, I don't know who created the names. I didn't, but they finally, I guess, came up with a creative name and called it Spy Wednesday. But Holy Wednesday, also known as Spy Wednesday, is the day that Judas actually conspires to betray Jesus. And again, if you're familiar with the story, we know that Judas was one of the 12 and he betrays Jesus. Basically, he sells out Jesus for some silver. The scripture, uh, what is it? Mark 14, verse 10 through 11 says, then Judas Iscariot, one of the 12, went to the chief priests to betray Jesus to them, right? They already didn't like him. And now Judas, Jesus is one of his closest companions sold him out, right? Went to them. They were delighted to hear this and promised to give him money. So he watched for an opportunity to hand him over. So there was not a lot in scripture about what Jesus did that day, but this is clear. This is the day that Judas, one of Jesus's 12 disciples, decides to betray him. And I don't know about y'all, but if, has anybody ever been betrayed by a close friend? And I mean, it's not a good feeling, right? Especially if you're doing what you're supposed to do, right? So this is the day that Judas sells out Jesus, a close friend, for some silver. And so this is also, again, where it takes a turn, right? We went from Jesus giving an amazing sermon, Jesus demonstrating his authority, Jesus walking into the city and everybody's praising him to now one of his closest friends, uh, betraying him. And so, but Jesus, he, he keeps doing what he's doing, right? He keeps ministering. He keeps doing what he is supposed to do. And he gets tired. He falls asleep and he wakes up. And what day is it? Oh, y'all need to wake up. Day five. Say day five. Day five. So this part right here is probably the most famous part, mainly because when there was a, a, a famous painting, I can't remember who painted it, Mike, Michelangelo or somebody maybe? I don't know. The Last Supper, right? So we're all familiar with The Last Supper, right? Yeah. All right. And so this, this part was so busy that I actually have to split it into two parts. So we'll cover the other part next week. Um, but basically, we get The Last Supper out of this. But there's something that Jesus does at The Last Supper. Does anybody know what it is? Go ahead. Yes, he washes their feet. So we get that from there. Anything else? What else did Jesus do? Go ahead. He said one of them. Yep. He had communion. Yes. So that's an important one. So Jesus, all of them are important. Let me let me say that. But that that's one of them. This is where we get what's called the Lord's Supper. If so, basically, when when as Christians, we are called to do the Lord's Supper, and we get that from here. And so we'll get to that scripture here in just a moment. Um, but there's another thing that he does. He, he also gives a new commandment. He tells them to love one another. But let's, let's pull up um, Luke chapter 22. It says, when the hour came, Jesus and his apostles reclined at the table, and he said to them, I can picture, by the way, if I'm reclining at the table, my mom would be like, get your feet off my table, sit up straight, boy. But anyway, so that's how they ate. They reclined at the table. And he said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, 
I will not eat again until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. After taking the cup, he gave thanks and said, take this and divide it among you. For I tell you, I will not drink again from the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to them, saying, This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. So Jesus does this for a couple of reasons. One, it's the Last Supper, it's the Passover. How many of y'all are familiar with the Passover? So the Passover is the story about when the Israelites are in Egypt, and basically Moses tells them, hey, this is what God said. He said, put blood of the lamb on your posts, and God is going to send an angel of death. And if you got the blood on your post, it basically symbolizes that you are gods and you will be spared. And those who did not, their firstborn will be killed. So the Israelites have been celebrating this ever since. Jesus is doing a couple of things here. One, he's reminding them of the Passover and the lamb, right? Because for many of us, we know that Jesus is the lamb of God. He's also telling them this to remember, right? Why do we need to remember? Because life is hard, right? Life is hard, right? Like, we need to remember. We need to remember, right? When you, when you forget Sometimes that's when it gets the hardest. Like, I don't know. I just feel like I'm alone. Anybody ever felt like that before? Like, I just feel like I'm alone. But then I remember I'm not. I have family. I have friends, right? And so he's telling us to remember, but he's telling us, more importantly, to remember him. And this is why, as believers, we take communion. This is, um, so this is uh, one of the main points is communion, also known as the Lord's Supper. And then the second thing he does during this time is in John 13, 34, He says, a new command I give you, love one another as I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. I'm just going off script for a second, but like, isn't that mind boggling to think that to love one another is a new command? Right? Like, we all kind of probably maybe heard somebody tell us that, be nice, be kind, love one another, right? Like, but Jesus is telling them something. And actually, if you look back, Jesus tells, um, when Jesus is questioned, what are the greatest two commandments? He says, love your God with all your heart, love your soul, with all your soul, your strength, and your mind, and love your neighbor as, he, as you love yourself. And so this new command, I think he's specifically telling believers Love one another so much that people be like, man, like I, I thought Christians were just, you know, snooty, whatever. Like, but man, watching the way y'all love each other, I want to be a part of that, right? Love one another. That's the command that Jesus gives his disciples. Also, they was kind of knuckleheads, like we all are, right? And so he had to remind them, like, love one another, serve one another, right? And so. I know this is a lot of information coming at y'all, but I'm going to have y'all do me a favor. Turn around at your tables. I'm going to give y'all five uh, questions just to help y'all, help us all, I guess, to have actionable plans for Palm Sunday. So the questions are, one, listen to the questions real quick. So what are some ways that you can praise King Jesus this Palm Sunday? Remember, This is the day they're praising him. So think about that in your mind. What are ways that we can praise King Jesus this coming Sunday? Two, what are some things you and I can cleanse from our lives this Holy Monday? Our bodies are a temple, right? That's what the New New Testament says, is that when we become believers, our bodies are the spirit of the Holy Spirit, or the, the, the vessel or the temple of the Holy Spirit. So what are some things maybe we can cleanse? Third question, what are some ways you can trust Jesus more deeply, right? Because life is hard. That's why we need to trust Jesus. Four, what are some ways you need to be forgiven and or show forgiveness to somebody else this, uh, this Holy Wednesday, right? Jesus was betrayed. And then number five, what are some ways... You can better love one another 
this Thursday. So take, I mean, you got about 10 minutes, I guess. Take 10 minutes around your tables, and then we'll bring it back. We're, I just want to hear what some people from um, each table had for us. So um, let's start with this back table right here. And I would like students, not leaders, to, to speak. Thank you. Okay. Mm, yeah, that's good. Go ahead, keep going. <laughs> okay, understandable. <laughs> I was not a great student. So, you back it up to number four? You want to let that teacher animosity out? It's okay, you're around your peers. It's a safe place. Is there any teachers in the building? I'm sorry. Okay, that's good. That's good. Great. You know what? Because you went through all... You give them a round of applause. <laughs> Avery, I'm sorry. I don't think you can eat this, but you can pick one of these bags and bring it to your table. Oh, look at that. Look at the... Man. Look at this. And the... Great job. Wow. Okay. I guess I just start with the cookies and I'll actually get people to listen. <laughs> I saw somebody doing their taxes while I was um, talking about day three, so, yeah. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Let me hear from this back table right here. Ariel. Ariel told me she had a number five. So, Ariel, let me hear what you got for number five. No pressure. Make it good. Okay. All right. Great job. Great job. Give it up for the back table right here. All right. Right there. Whatever one you want. Mm. Yeah. That's great. Only reason why I'm not going to give you cookies, though you did a great job, is because you have the student minister sitting next to you. So you I had to have good answers. <laughs> but man, give them a round of applause. <laughs> you know what? Just for the sake of time, I'm going to give it to y'all because we only got one minute left. All right. So real quick, recap, recap, recap. Okay. So I know this was a lot of information, but be thinking about these. If you got your phone, Mark normally says no phones, I will let you take out your phone if you want to take a screenshot of that, because I think that is gold. I think that's something that we can be doing. Now remember, Sunday is approaching. Holy Week is upon us. Next Wednesday, we will actually be on Spy Wednesday, but I won't be talking about that. But it will be the day before Maundy Thursday. Now, real quick with Maundy Thursday, by the way, I forgot to mention the reason it's called that is because of the new command. Maundy comes from the word where we get mandate or command. But we actually, as a campus, will travel to the Loop campus 
to celebrate Broken For You, which celebrates or commemorates Monday Thursday. We'll do communion. So if you want to come join us, then just let us know. And um, we take a tr um, like a charter bus. And so if you're interested in coming, that would be a great way to walk out this, right? Last thing I'll say, and then I'll close in prayer. So why is this called prism? Why is this message called prism, right? What is a prism, right? Uh, yeah, I hear somebody. Don't steal my thunder now. Um, so, right, this is a prism. But, you know, a prism is a... If you ever Google the, or look it up, I use dictionary.com all the time. If you look up the definition of a prism, it'll actually give you all of the geometric things about why it's a prism. So a prism is really a prism because it's a geometric shape that fits a certain standard. But usually prisms are made out of glass or crystal, right? And they look cool, right? They look cool. So I bought this as a prop. It didn't work, so I might just keep it on my desk. If Mark, like, unless he wants the money back and I put a ministry, whatever. <laughs> but anyways, and so, but what makes prisms cool is the fact that when you shine white light in it, it creates a rainbow, right? And I don't know about, about you, but I've probably seen hundreds, if not a thousand rainbows in my life. But every time I see a rainbow, I never get tired of seeing a rainbow. Actually, usually, it depends on my angle, but I always take a picture of it, and I'll send it to somebody. Like, man, did you see that rainbow? And, you know, and which the story of the rainbow, right, is the story of Noah and the flood and God putting a rainbow up in the sky at the end of the flood, promising that he will not flood the earth again, right? But rainbows, they still, they, I mean, even if I didn't know that story, they just look amazing. But I would say this. The Easter story is kind of like a prism, right? It looks cool. It's good, like, without the light shining through it, right? It looks nice. I can leave it right here, and people will stare at it like, wow, that's nice crystal. <laughs> but I would say Holy Week is kind of like that light shining through it, right? And actually, I see a little rainbow right here, and I wasn't going to do that because I tried light, and it wouldn't work. But that's what Holy Week is. It's about shining a light through the prism so we can see the entire beauty of what the Easter story is. And so that's the challenge. That's the goal is for us to go deeper in our understanding and our appreciation for what Jesus did. And ultimately, right, spoiler alert, that he died on the cross for our behalf, right? But the good news is, right, that he didn't stay dead. Like the greatest event in human history is that he came back to life beating sin and death, like that song we sung. And so I don't ever want us, myself included, to get to lose that, that awe and wonder of Easter and Holy Week and what God did for us. And so if you don't know Jesus, it's real simple, right? The Bible says, believe in your heart, confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and that he raised from the dead and you too will be saved. And if you do believe in Jesus, remember, right? Remember right? Because that's where our hope is, right? And so I challenge y'all to walk out some of those steps that we had, right? And to really go deeper in your faith. If you want to talk afterwards, we got leaders, myself, Mark, we'll be more than happy to talk to y'all. But I'll close in prayer and y'all be dismissed. Heavenly Father, we come in Jesus' name, thankful for today, Lord. Thankful because we have hope. We have hope in Jesus, we have hope in a resurrected Savior that went through so much for us, Lord. May we not lose sight of that. May we have a special place in our hearts and our minds for what you did on Resurrection Day, on Easter Sunday, when you beat sin and death on our behalf, Lord. We thank you for that because we couldn't do it ourselves, Lord. We all fall short. But we thank you, Lord, that you did that for us so that we can have fellowship with you, Lord. So I just pray right now for all of our students, even our leaders, Lord, that you would remind us, Lord, that we would never lose sight of you, Lord. When things are easy, when things are difficult, Lord, I pray, Lord, for your spirit to continue to just awe us, Lord, for, for Easter to just awe us, Lord, and that you would just show up like you always do, Lord, in a way that we remember, Lord. So go before us today, Lord. Give us everything we need to glorify you. And may we never forget, never lose sight of the cross. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.